before I jump into today's message, I just want to say I love your pastors and I want to honor them today. Pastor Ron and Kelly Woods are, they are not just like family to me, they are family to me, by the way. My mom and Pastor Kelly are sisters and, um, and I, my, my kids, my wife, we love you so much. We honor you for what, not only who you are to us, but what you have done and how you've led this church. And it's inspiring to me. If you are new to this church, you need to know this is one of the most generous churches in the world. And I, I'm sitting here looking at the neighbors and nations and, and what you're doing around the world, what you're doing here locally with veterans and first responders. And then I'm thinking about what this church has done for us. Our church is right in the beginning of a building project. We bought 17 acres right on the, the highway and we're super excited about it. We're excited about what God is going to do. And you just need to know that the first person uh, to invest in our, the purchasing of our land was not a person. It was a group of people. It was you. The assembly is the first offering towards our land. And so I'm here today from my church, Love Church in Northern Virginia, tell, on behalf of them telling you, thank you for being such a generous church. You are making a difference all across the world. And when we build our building, uh, you're going to be able to say, and if you ever visit Northern Virginia, come by and say hi. You're going to be able to say, we sowed into that. If you sow into this house, you sowed into us. And I want to say thank you. And I want to honor your church and honor your pastors. And I hope today over the next few minutes um, that this message is going to help you as we're kicking off this series. We're talking about forgiveness today. There are no, you cannot have successful relationships without the ability and the willingness to forgive. Do you know that? In marriage and parenting and your work relationships, young people in, in your friendships at, at school and uh, you know, church relationships. Come on, you can't be in church for very long without getting hurt because church is people. If you don't have the ability or the willingness to forgive, relationships will not work. If you can't forgive, you can't love like Jesus because Jesus has an agape love, a selfless, sacrificial, uh, humble, serving, forgiving love. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to be a, a, a representative of him, you just need to know we're going we're gonna to love differently. We're going to treat people differently. We're going to, we're going to forgive people that don't deserve it. That's, that's just the flow of a Christian. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 6. He says, if you only love those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. Like any, anybody can love people who love them back when there's something in return uh, it's easy to do. He says, and if you, if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. He says, love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to be repaid. And then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the most high for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Corn, if you are a follower of Jesus today, you need to know we just act differently. We treat people differently. We respond differently. We don't act like everybody else. We love people who can't love us back. We forgive people who don't deserve to be forgiven. Why in the world would we do that? Because of the cross and the resurrection. Because we serve a savior who loved us, who forgave us before we could do anything for him. While we were sinners, Christ died. Paul tells the Romans. That means before we even ever turned, before we ever believed, before we ever did good works, before we did anything, he died for us in advance. That's our model. Is we, like in our church, we have this saying that says, we love you already. We love you before we even know who you are. Before you even come, we already love you. Jesus says, I, all, I offer you forgiveness before you do anything in return. And so as we come off of Easter, we just um, need to be reminded today that the cross and the resurrection um, have deposited into us the currency of forgiveness. I'm going to talk today about forgiveness. And without Jesus, we are bankrupt, bankrupt in the forgiveness category. We don't have the ability to to treat people nicely that don't treat us nicely in return. We'll, we'll be doing it out of our own willpower. It'll run out quickly, but when we live and we function and we act with the spirit of God in us that was deposited into us because of what Jesus did, we can live lives that are completely different. Jesus says in Matthew 10, eight, freely you have received, 
so freely you give. The reason that we can give anything, including today, in today's context, forgiveness, is because we've received it freely. Paul says, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. The Bible doesn't say forgive those that apologize, forgive those that deserve it, forgive once they've proven that they deserve to be forgiven. It says the Lord forgave you, so you forgive others. And I would just humbly say, gently say this, because I include me in this sometimes, is that uh, there are a lot of forgiven people in the room that refuse to forgive others. Is that we have the somehow developed, and sometimes it's just by not paying attention, it's just life, whatever, selfishness. We develop the audacity to come into church, to be in God's presence. Writer of Hebrews says the only way we're here is because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for our sins. In God's presence, we come to church, we receive what God has, and then have the audacity to turn around and withhold forgiveness from others because they don't deserve it, forgetting that neither do we. And so today we need to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us and reminded of what it helps us do to others. Last weekend was a reminder of that. Baptisms today is a reminder of that. As we go into the waters of baptism, these people are going in saying, I've been washed clean by Jesus. I didn't earn my way there. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Paul wrote a reminder to the Colossian church. He said, you were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. And yet now he's reconciled you to himself through what? Through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he's brought you into his own presence. Come on, how many are thankful for this? And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault, not without a fault because you don't have faults without a fault because he died for your faults and now when God sees you, he sees perfection. Not because you're perfect, we're not perfect, but because he sees you through the lens of what Jesus has done. And then Paul says in verse 23, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Come on, there are some of you today that are here, you've been Christian longer than I've been alive today. You already know this, but, but, but the Bible says that part of why we gather is to remind each other of these truths. Today, we need to be reminded of what Jesus has done. For some of you today, this is like, you'll be hearing some of this for the first time, or you might hear this in a way that you've never heard it before, and it's a, a moment of, uh, of enlightenment, like I've, I heard that, or that makes sense, or God really spoke to me, but for some of us, we know it. We just need to be stirred up again to be reminded that we have been forgiven and therefore we leave this place today willing and stirred up and motivated to forgive those that have hurt us even if and especially if they don't deserve it because that's what Jesus has done for us. So the title of the message is the force of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a powerful force. The force of forgiveness. I'm going to pray really quickly. God we open your word today with humility and expectation. And God, I pray that you would speak to each one of us in a very powerful and real and personal way that as we leave this place, we leave differently than we came. More in love with you, deeper, stronger faith in you. So speak to us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 I have a tradition when I preach at my church, but I'm bringing it to your church today. And I did last time I was here and the time before that. And that's that I tell dad jokes towards the beginning of my message. And so a few years ago, it was at Father's Day, I told a dad joke to the church and the next week, the people absolutely revolted. And they said, you have to tell dad jokes again. Actually, it was the guys. The women roll their eyes at me, the guys laugh and use the jokes at work on Monday. So guys, here you go. What do you call a deer with no eyes? No idea. It is risky telling a, a joke as a, as a guest preacher because you risk losing all dignity. <laughs> Who would come and tell a dad joke at the beginning of their message? What kind of music do chiropractors listen to? Hip hop. <laughs> That's funny. I am kind of addicted to dad jokes at this point. It's my church's fault, but I used to be addicted to the hokey pokey. But then I turned myself around. <laughs> and that's what it's all about. And if you're not laughing, that's your problem. 
No, okay. Colossians 3, verse 13. This would kind of be our anchor verse for today. I have seven points. Don't, don't get worried. We're going to move through them fast. Seven points on forgiveness. But before we get to them, Colossians 3, 13. This is what I was referring to earlier. Paul has talked about what Jesus has done, the sufficiency of Christ, Colossians 1. And then he moves into how this applies to our life. Here in chapter 3, we get a strong command by Paul. And this is for us today. And this sets the tone for the day as we're talking about relationships. We all need to be reminded of the power of forgiveness. He says in verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, there it is. Remember the Lord forgave you. So you must, everybody say must. Oh, that's hard. It's hard to say that. It's hard to receive. You must. This is not a suggestion. This is not for like really strong Christians or church people. This is a command. You must. Jesus has forgiven you. You must forgive others. There's so much packed into this one verse that would help us in relationships if this is all we looked at today. First of all, make allowance for each other's faults. You all know what allowance is? Any of y'all ever got an allowance when, when you're young? And any of you ever give your kids an allowance? It's basically you're gonna get money in advance to be able to spend that week, that month, whatever it is. This is your allowance. This is what you're allowed to spend. Paul uses this language, the NLT translates, make allowance for, to say this, and this is powerful. Spouses, this, listen to this, that we are in advance going to make allowance for each other to be imperfect. Think about this. I, I wake up in the morning and I'm going to, in advance, give my spouse, for example, I'm going to give Brittany an allowance for being imperfect. What if we actually lived like that? So that the first time that she's imperfect or the first time she, and she is pretty close to perfect, my wife, the first time she does anything wrong, it's not withdrawing from me. It just comes out of the allowance I've already given her. Isn't that a powerful concept? That I'm in advance going to decide she's imperfect, I'm imperfect. Let's give grace to each other. So this is like before we even get started with this day, before we even get started with this week, I'm going to in advance give an allowance for people. And this is hardest to do with the people that are closest to us. Don't nudge your spouse that I'm going to, in advance, make an allowance for them not to be perfect. That's powerful in and of itself. But then Paul goes on to say, and then when it does, when they do hurt you, to forgive anyone who offends you. How many know this is countercultural? In a day and age where we're highly or so easily offended, if for the people of God, we're supposed to live unoffendable. When somebody offends me, this is my response, I forgive them. That shouldn't really be radical, but how many know that's radical in this day and age? And because and, in our culture, it's like, if you hurt me, I hurt you back. Or as the young people would say, I cancel you. Or whatever the case may be, when you do something, I retaliate. I'm going, I'm going to treat you differently because and in the kingdom of God, the people of God, come on, we just celebrated the, uh, uh, our savior, the Messiah who came and hung on a cross for us. We celebrate a savior. We remember a savior who, while he was nailed to a tree after being beaten, mocked, whipped, ultimately crucified, he hangs on that cross and he says, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. This is our savior. This is who we follow. This is how we as Christians operate. As we say, you offend me, I forgive you. Paul says, so we make allowance for each other's faults. We forgive those who offend us. And remember, here's the reminder. Don't forget, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And today, if you have never been forgiven by God, see the forgiveness of God is offered to everybody, everyone. While we were still sinners, Christ died. The cross is an invitation open to all. But the only way that it applies to your life is for you to believe. You don't have to do good works. You don't have to live up to some moral standard. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to give in an offering. All of those things are good and our responses to the grace of God. And we end up doing those. Those aren't bad things, but God didn't say you have to do those things. He says, you got to believe that it happened. 
Here's what separates believers from non-believers, Christians from non-Christians, people that are going to heaven from people that are going to hell. What separates us is the ones going to heaven simply say, I believe that it happened. And because I believe that he is who he says he is, he really died, he really rose, and it was really for my sin. When I admit that, when I confess that, when I believe that, put my faith in him, it's at that moment that I become forgiven. The forgiveness that was offered now applies to my life. My prayer is that today as we talk about forgiveness, the, the highest and best thing that could happen in this service is for those that have never received that forgiveness to receive it. To realize that the greatest example of forgiveness is what Jesus Jesus did for us and that you have the opportunity to be forgiven today of sin, which by the way, changes your ultimate destination from eternal death and damnation to eternal life with Jesus. The spirit of God comes inside of you, lives in you, brings you to life in a way that formerly you were dead in, separated from God on the inside. That's the best thing that could happen. But then the second thing that I pray and I've been praying would happen this weekend is that those of us that do follow would remember what Jesus has done and leave this place today determined and stirred up and motivated to forgive others. I heard a preacher say this, if everyone in heaven is forgiven and everyone in hell is not forgiven, which is true, then when we forgive, we pull heaven to earth. And when we withhold forgiveness, we pull hell up to earth. And isn't that so true in our lives when we withhold forgiveness and we're bitter and we're angry, it's like hell on earth. And even science and medicine is catching up to what the Bible has always said is that that resentment and that bitterness is actually literally bad for your emotional health. What God has been saying the whole time is, is if we'll do it his way coin, then we can live a healthier life. Let's pull heaven to earth. Jesus said, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we live the way that Jesus modeled and taught us to live, we pull heaven to earth. We advance the kingdom of God forward. We preach the gospel. And when we forgive, we preach louder than any sermon that I could preach because people see the gospel in action. Amen. All right, if we're gonna, if we're gonna live this out, I'm gonna kinda transition to our, our seven points. Um, and I'm gonna kinda just be in teaching mode here. We, we are gonna talk about seven things that forgiveness is not in order to learn about what forgiveness is. Because we want to do what Jesus said, but there are some misconceptions about forgiveness, things that we've picked up along the way, and maybe we've heard it before, or maybe we've just assumed it. And so today, I wanna talk about seven lies about forgiveness, lies about forgiveness. These are things that forgiveness isn't. When Jesus is asking us to forgive, he's not necessarily saying these things, and this will help us illuminate what forgiveness is. So are you ready? We're gonna go through these. Here we go, lie number one. If you're a note taker, this is a good message. You got seven of them. Here we go, lie number one. Forgiveness is reconciliation. Forgiveness can lead to reconciliation, but we need to know today that forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. We'll use the truth of the cross and the resurrection like we just talked about. When Jesus offered forgiveness at the cross, how many know that doesn't mean automatically everybody is reconciled? You know, it, we need to know that God's will is that not even one would perish, that God wants everyone to be reconciled. He wants all of us to believe. That's his desire. And listen, church, we should desire reconciliation. Over these next few minutes as I teach some things and some of the things we're gonna talk about are, are are hard truths that sometimes reconciliation is not possible. Sometimes reconciliation is not wise, but let us not mistake the fact that reconciliation is always the goal. Well, we want reconciliation for every marriage. We want reconciliation for every child that's estranged from their family. A a every relationship that you have that, there, that, is, that is broken, where there is tension, where there has been major pain. Come on, reconciliation would be the goal. God's heart is reconciliation. Jesus came to reconcile God and man, and it's our job to reconcile the world to God. This is the heart of God is reconciliation, but how many know not everybody's gonna be reconciled? And the reality is in your life and in those situations, and there are many painful situations, even after the services so far this weekend, talking to people about just very real, intense situations in their lives, and sometimes reconciliation is not possible. Sometimes you need to forgive someone who's not alive anymore. There's, that, that's, you know, reconciliation is not possible in that case. Sometimes you need to forgive someone who 
you, sh- you have no business being in a relationship with again because of the things that have happened, because of the actions that they've taken, because of the factors involved. And how do you know when, that's, when it, sh- there, it should be restored and when it shouldn't be? That's why you need godly people in your life. That's why you gotta be a part of a church. That's why you gotta have pastors. That's why you have to have small group leaders. That's why you have to have mentors in your life who can help you know what's wise. But we need to know today that you don't have to reconcile with someone just to forgive them. Forgiveness is different than reconciliation. It's the first step, but it's the most important step. And reconciliation is not commanded, but forgiveness is. So lie number two, similar, but you need to be released from this if you're the one that needs to to give forgiveness, but you can't let go, you can't forget what that person did. You need to know that forgiveness is not forgetting. It's a lie to say, so we all know that phrase forgive and forget, right? That sounds good, but that's not really possible. And in some cases that's dumb. Come on, if somebody steals something from you, Somebody steals something from you, you can forgive them, but you might not want to forget that. And so forgive and forget is not necessarily a great, a great phrase. And, and, and if not great, it, might not, it just might not be possible. You might say, well, the Bible says he remembers our sins no more. Well, let's remember that that's God that we're talking about and we aren't God. There's never a command for us to forget. So I'm trying to teach you today as we're talking about forgiveness being a command, let's not blindly step in and and do things that are not wise. So I'm trying to help you. It it might not be wise to forget what happened. And and, in a lot of cases, it's not possible to forget what happened. That doesn't let you off the hook from the command to forgive. Forgiveness is not forgetting. God remembers our sins no more. I'm thankful for the grace and the mercy of God and for the fact that an all-knowing God who knows every single thing about you and the world and stands outside of time and space has made the decision to remember our sins no more. It makes it that much more powerful that we can't, we don't have the ability to do that, but God has chosen to forget our sin. That's a powerful concept, everybody. But we've never been instructed to forget. We have been instructed to forgive. Mistreating someone for their past sins, though, that's ungodly. We should forget in the sense that we don't treat some, we don't mistreat someone based off of the mistakes that they've made in their past. We don't label someone based off of the mistakes that they've made in their past. We don't hold their mistakes over their head at the same time. Many times there needs to be boundaries drawn. Many times you do need to hold your ground to create those healthy boundaries. How I many of that's godly and that's wise, but we sure can choose not to be bitter about it, not to stew about it, not to mistreat people because of it, not to hang it over their head, but we don't need to choose to forget. We need to choose to forgive. Forgiveness is not forgetting. So the first thing is forgiveness is, is not reconciliation necessarily. Forgive, forgiveness is not necessarily forgetting. Here's lie number three. This is a lie that forgiveness should wait for an apology. The Bible doesn't say they apologize to you, so you must forgive them. <laughs> the Bible says the Lord forgave you so you must forgive them. You ever been in a situation where you're like, they don't deserve, they haven't apologized. When they apologize, I'll forgive. Come on, we know this, this is so foundational. This line number three, most of us already know, but even though we know it, it can be so hard to put it into action. If you've ever tried to forgive someone that refuses to apologize. But let me propose this to you. If forgiveness is a command to us and the person that hurt us hasn't apologized or refuses to apologize or won't apologize, then what we're doing is we're letting their disobedience, rebellion, keep us in disobedience. So not only did they hurt us, they continue to hurt us. Not only did they take something from us, they continue to take something from us. Not only did they negatively impact our life, they continue to negatively impact our lives because we're allowing their rebellion or their pride or whatever it may be to keep us in disobedience. Yes, disobedience. He said, you must forgive. And so when we release them from what we feel like they owe us, 
we are now finally putting an end to the control that they have over our lives. Do you know that that's at, at its core, what forgiveness is, is releasing them of what they owe. Let me just pause right here and just say, this is like, like use finances. This will be an easy um, model to, to use to understand what forgiveness is. If somebody, if you loan somebody $100, they now owe you $100. So they either pay it back at once or they pay it back over time, whatever it is, they're in debt to you. The moment you say, you don't owe me anymore, that means that you don't expect that back anymore. They're free from that. They no longer live owing you anything. That's forgiving their debt. Well, that's what we do with people. How many know when, when somebody does something to you, it steals. Maybe somebody stole your innocence when you were young. Maybe somebody stole from you comfort. Maybe they stole from you Physically, maybe they stole from you normality. Maybe your life has never been the same. They stole what was always, how things always were. Maybe they stole from you a peaceful family. Whatever it might be, they took something from you. Here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is saying, it's not changing what they did. It's not acting like it didn't happen. It's saying, I'm not gonna live my life as if you owe me anything anymore. So I release you from that. And when you release them from that, you release yourself from being constantly controlled by the thing that they did in the past. And if that was the only reason to forgive someone, it would be worth it for your health, for your sake, for your soul. But that's not the only reason. Here's another reason, because God told us to do it. I mean, obedience should be the only reason that we need. Here's another reason, there's reward for obedience. You're storing up eternal reward when you obey God on earth, no matter how hard it is. Here's another reason, when you forgive someone, you never know what that's gonna do in their life and in their heart when they see the forgiveness of God displayed in this situation. Like I said, that's a message that'll preach louder than any message that I could preach or that a church could preach. You might end up being the catalyst for them to experience God in a way that they never would have. Forgiveness should not wait for an apology. Forgiveness is commanded by God. And when I do it, I'm not doing it because they've done something to earn it. I'm doing it because God gave it to me when I didn't do anything to earn it. Amen. Lie number four, forgiveness removes the pain. Come on, this is a lie. Forgiveness doesn't take away the pain. Forgiveness can set us on a journey to get past the pain. Forgiveness can help with the pain, but forgiveness doesn't remove the pain. And one of the worst things you could tell somebody that has been wronged or they've been hurt is to say, you know, if they're in pain still is to say, well, maybe you must not have forgiven them. Don't ever say it. You must, you must need to forgive them. That could compound the problem. Pain doesn't go away. I heard one preacher say that many times we're going to be forgiving through tears. We're going to be obeying God through pain. Jesus never promised us no pain. In fact, unfortunately, guys. He promised us the opposite. In this world, there will be trouble, tribulation. But but here's the promise, but you can take heart for I've overcome the world. And so as you're forgiving people that don't deserve it, it might be painful. You might be doing it through tears. You might be doing it in the midst of pain. But again, we worship a savior who forgave people as he's hanging on a cross. If we want to follow him out of the tomb, if we want to follow him into heaven, if we want to follow him to the throne and receive our crown, our inheritance, we have to follow him through Golgotha. We have to follow him to a cross. We can't have the reward without the sacrifice. We can't have the benefits without the obedience. And so we are, we're doing this even in the midst of pain, even if it doesn't take away the pain because it's what he's told us to do. Forgiveness is not ceasing to feel pain. This should encourage some people who have forgiven and you still hurt. That doesn't necessarily mean you haven't forgiven. It's that what happened caused so much pain that you're still feeling the effects of what was done to you. And that's why we need each other. That's why we need church. That's why we need godly friendships is so that we can walk this walk and keep each other encouraged and cry with each other and laugh with each other and, 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 and live this life together. Lie number five is that forgiveness is a one-time event. 
You need to know today, forgiveness is a lifetime process. Forgiveness is ongoing. And especially if the hurt has been, has been intense or big, some things are easy. You know, somebody says something bad to you, you know, whatever, you forgive them. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you let it go. That's, you forgive them. But there are, there are huge, huge, probably everybody in the room probably has something that's huge. Some of, some of you have multiple things. There, there are, if we went around and just had coffee with each other and talked about the, the greatest pains in our lives, it would, it would probably equally shock you and equally encourage you to know that you're not alone in this place today. And, and so for those big painful ones, you gotta wake up every day and make the decision to forgive. Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I forgive my brother who's hurt me? Seven? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. And, and he, what, he, what Jesus was saying was more of a phrase, not a number. He wasn't saying 490 times and then you stop. He was saying, this was a phrase to say, unlimited. You, you unli and and the, the question was, how many times do I forgive my brother who's hurt me? So that means like, you're gonna have to forgive an unlimited amount of times when somebody does something to you once. If, you, if you've been hurt by your spouse before, if you've been wronged by your spouse, if there's been infidelity in a, in a marriage, then you'll know what I'm saying is true. And this applies to every situation, but when one of those really intense, painful situations happens, here's what will happen. You've been wronged. Down the road, time goes by, you get into a similar situation or there are some similar factors or there's a similar circumstance. Uh, there's what we would call triggers that happen. You get triggered, you get reminded, you get stirred up, you, you, you get flashbacks and, and, and eventually you find yourself mad all over again about something that nothing happened again necessarily. It's just you're mad again about something that happened before. How many know in that moment you have to choose again in that moment to forgive? I'm going to forgive them again. They didn't even do anything else. I just have to forgive again because there's emotion again, and you can start to hold them captive again, or you're ready for this, to hold them in debt to you again. And if you are the one that's inflicted the pain, and I, and I pray that, that, that today as we're talking about forgiveness, we don't only receive this as people who need to give forgiveness, we need to also receive this as every one of us in this room has inflicted pain, and we need other people to forgive us. So hopefully we can take and then the Holy Spirit will help with this. We can take this teaching and it can help us on the other end. If we are the ones that have wronged someone, to have grace for them, to not force them or rush them, or I thought you forgave me. Why aren't things back to normal? I thought you forgave me. Our relationship seems to be different. Sometimes it is different. It's different because you lost the right for it to go back to being the same. I thought you, you know, and so we have to be patient with people to know that this is a lifetime of forgiveness. It's unlimited. It's continuous. And I thank God that again, every thing I'm talking about today with forgiveness, every part of this that God's asking us to do, he does. He forgave us at the cross, but how many sinned this week? <laughs> Some of you sinned on the way to church today. <laughs> and, and you need God, you need that forgiveness of God to cover you today. You need that forgiveness of God to cover you tomorrow, right? Amen. Some of y'all are just staring at me like you never commit a sin. That's your sin. <laughs> that you act like you don't commit sin. <laughs> Kidding. We all need the forgiveness of God every day. We're forgiven once, but we're forgiven every day. And we need to forgive those that have, har that have harmed us, that have caused pain to us. We need to forgive. We need to come to the place where we can say, I forgive you. But then it's got to be ongoing. Amen. Lie number six is that forgiveness restores trust. Trust is gained in drops, but it's lost in buckets. And it's a lie to think that just because I forgive someone, I'm gonna be able to trust them again. If you're the one who's caused the harm, we need to remember, if I've, if I've harmed someone, they've forgiven me, that doesn't mean that they need to or ever will necessarily automatically trust me again. Can I speak to the guys in the room? Because, come on, guys, we're fixers. We like to fix things, you know? You, you get flat tire, you put a new tire on. Your wife gets a flat tire. You go fix the tire. You fix the car. You fix the house. We fix things. That's what we do. 
until you do something wrong and you try to fix it fast like you had fixed the tire and it doesn't seem to work the same way. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like, well, I, what, 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 what can I do to earn your trust back? And she goes, this is the, this is the worst, guys. I mean, it's happened to me. Yeah, it's the worst. She goes, I don't know. I mean, that's the worst for a guy. Like, how do you know what to fix if you don't know what, how to fix it? Like, you figure it out then. Tell me how I can restore my trust so we can restore the trust. You just need to know. If you dumped that bucket of trust out, I know this is not a feel good. This is when it's hard to say amen to. This doesn't feel great. This is just the truth though. It's gonna be filled up with a, drop, a dropper. One decision, one act of faithfulness, over a length of time. Here's the good news, it can be restored. But rushing them, trying to get them to trust, you, no, no, just give it to God and go, God, I'm gonna obey you, I'm gonna follow you, I'm gonna put one foot in front of the other, and I know that over time, trust can be rebuilt, but let's not get it mistaken today that just because we forgive doesn't mean that trust is restored. If we've been the ones that have been harmed, we need to know that just because I forgive doesn't mean that I'm forced to trust them again, but, but hear me, church, for any relationship to be healthy, there does need to be trust. And this goes for men and women, but since I was just talking to the men, let me talk to the women. At some point, you have to be vulnerable enough to trust again or there never will be any relationship. That there, there has to be trust now. Does it need to be restored? Does that, does that need to be wise, especially if lines have been crossed in, in very harmful ways? Yes, of course, but the goal should be to trust again. And ultimately, we have to realize that it's in God's hands. Ultimately, we have to realize that I can't control everything. And if, I've, if you've been hurt, you really need to hear that if you've been hurt, your tendency is going to want to be to control everything about the situation, maybe to an extreme to where you're trying to manipulate the situation. But ultimately, we have to realize God's in control. God's in control of my marriage. God's in control of this person. This is God's child. God's in control of me. I can only get ultimate fulfillment from him anyway. He's ultimately the only one that's never going to fail me anyway. Don't ever look to your spouse to be what only God can be. Don't ever look to, you know, your friend to be what only God can be. For goodness sake, don't look to your, even your pastor to be what only God can be. Listen, people will fail us. People are imperfect. God will never fail us. God is perfect. God is faithful. And so we look to him. We look to him to get, to get those things. And then from that assurance and security, then we can extend trust to other people and have healthy, God-honoring relationships. The last lie about forgiveness is that forgiveness is losing. What I mean is that forgiveness is going to feel many times as weakness. Forgiveness is gonna feel like if I forgive them, I've caved. If I forgive them, they're gonna, they're going to think that it's okay. If I forgive them, it's going to be like they won. If, they, if, I, if I forgive them, some of you have been in such a standoff in a relationship. Some of you have been in a breached relationship for years. And you feel like if I just walked out of this place and forgave them, it would be like all of that was for nothing. Like it would feel like a step backwards. You don't know what I'm talking about. Forgiveness can feel like losing. It can feel like you caved. It can feel like you've let them off the hook. After what they did, if I forgave them, they're gonna feel like, like I let them off the hook. You need to know today that if you let them off the hook, it's just your hook that you left them off of, you release them into the hands of God. You forgive someone, you're releasing them into the hands of God. Paul tells the Romans that revenge is the Lord's. The Lord handles the punishment. The Lord handles wrath. The Lord handles judgment. He's ultimately our judge. He's a righteous judge. Thank God that he is. We want righteous judgment in our lives. Thank God at the cross, his judgment collided with mercy. Mercy triumphed over his judgment. Judgment was still executed. Someone had to die. Thank God he sent himself in the form of his only son and it was Jesus. So the wages of sin was death and those wages were paid. 
Someone died, it was just him, not us. Mercy triumphed over judgment. Isn't that incredible? We feel like if we forgive, justice won't be served, but we're just releasing them to the righteous judge. God, God will take care of them, but we need to release them and stop trying to control them and control the situation and, and feel like, oh, we're losing or we're caving. No, 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 we're just following the pattern of Jesus Christ. When we release a non-believer into the hands of God, think about this, just think about it logically. If, they, if they're not a believer and they've harmed you, you still are commanded to forgive. Forgive anyone is the qualifier who offends you. So that's believer, non-believer. So if they're not a believer and, you offend, and they offend you, they hurt you and you forgive them, think about this. Their judgment is gonna be way worse. If they don't know Jesus, their judgment's way worse than anything you could ever do anyway. They're gonna experience the wrath of God but here's the other option. Here's what could happen. Non-believer experiences your forgiveness. It could be the catalyst for them experiencing the forgiveness of God. And that's what we want. You could end up being a part of their salvation because you forgave. And if not, they experience God's wrath anyway. You forgive a believer, you're reminding them of the forgiveness of Jesus. You're spurring them on to be more like God. You're releasing them to God. Either way, we win because we're partnering with Christ in obedience and to what he has said. And we're following his pattern that he went all the way to a cross to forgive us. And he experienced what surely felt like defeat on that Friday that was not good until Resurrection Sunday when we could then look back on the Friday and say that wasn't defeat that was victory Jesus wasn't being defeated by death Jesus was actually defeating death what looked like defeat was actually victory when you forgive someone you are participating in the victory of Christ even if it feels like defeat I'll close with Philippians 2 it says don't be selfish don't try to impress others be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, look out for the interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. This is the way, the way that we walk. Remember we talked about it at the beginning, we're different. This is different, Jesus is different. His, his kingdom is different. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. All right, now we're not God, but we can follow the same pattern. Though you are fill in the blank, maybe it's you're right. Though you're right, though you have a reason to hold it against them, though you have a reason to hold a grudge against them, though you have that, that's not something that you cling to. Jesus was God, but he didn't cling to that status. He emptied himself. It says he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience. That's our goal to God. And he died a criminal's death death on a cross. Therefore, everybody say, therefore, come on. This is the, how it works. You obey him unto the cross. Then you get the, therefore you obey Jesus when it's hard. Then you get a, therefore Jesus died a criminal's death on a cross. And therefore God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the father he humbles himself to a cross he gets elevated to a throne when we humble ourselves die to ourselves empty ourselves and say I'm gonna forgive you I'm gonna serve I'm gonna love those who don't deserve to be loved I'm gonna forgive those who don't deserve to be forgiven I'm living the way Jesus lived I'm having the attitude that Christ Jesus had and there's gonna be a therefore and it might be that day when we see him face to face but it might be on this side of eternity where we see the effects of of our forgiveness in that person's life or in our life. But even if we don't see it on this side of heaven, come on, how many know it's worth it for that therefore? Therefore, when we get there, it will have been worth it. Our job is to forgive. Our job is to obey. Our job is to humble ourselves. And my prayer is that we walk out of here today having been reminded of the forgiveness of God towards us and stirred up to show that forgiveness to other people. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna stand to our feet. We're gonna close our eyes. If you're here today and you're gonna be baptized, 
Um, I'll tell you right now, it would be a great time for you to go ahead and begin to move to get baptized. Everybody else, I, I want you to stay focused in this moment. We're about to pray two prayers and these are both very important. The first prayer that we're gonna pray is for those that are here today and you've never experienced the forgiveness of God for your sins. Second prayer that we're gonna pray is for all of us today that need the strength to be able to leave here today and extend forgiveness to those who have hurt us. But to this first group of people, every head bowed, every eye closed, this is what I wanna say to you. If you're here today and you don't know if you're forgiven, you should not walk out of this door wondering anymore. Jesus didn't die so that you would be unsure of whether you're forgiven. We serve a God who wants us to be sure of our salvation. And you're not saved because of anything that you do. We talked about that. You're saved because you believe. And if you're here today, you might have never been to a church and you're here to see somebody get baptized. You might have been to church your whole life, but you've never really received the forgiveness of God by believing that he died and rose for your sin. Going to church doesn't save us. Your dad might have been a Christian, your mom, might, your grandma might have been a Christian. You just always categorized yourself as a Christian. But categorizing yourself as a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. My question before we pray this prayer is if you're here today and you've never received the forgiveness of God by believing on Jesus Christ as your savior, my question is, do you want today to be that day? Do you wanna walk out of here sure that you've been forgiven by the grace and the mercy of God? If so, it's as simple as believing. And maybe you're here today and you've done that before, but you need to recommit your life to him. You've walked away from God. You wanna come back to a relationship with God today. Well, this prayer can be for you as well. With every Christian in this room believing, with every Christian praying right now for those that need to make this decision, whether it's your first time here or whether you're in church all the time, but you know you need to make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and the forgiveness of your sins right now is your moment. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna have you say anything, I'm not gonna have people look at you, but I wanna know who I'm praying with. And so right now, just shoot your hand up in the air. Lift your hand right now if that's you, right here, God bless you. Right over here, God bless you. And by that lifted hand, God bless you, sir. That's awesome. Right here in the middle, God bless you. By that lifted hand, hand, you're saying, I receive the forgiveness of God, then you can put it back down. Anybody else want to lift a hand and say, I need the forgiveness of my sins. All right, let's pray this prayer all together. Can we repeat this out loud? Everybody in the room with those that have lifted a hand, you repeat this after me. Here we go. God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Jesus, I receive you into my life as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sin. I repent and turn to you. I wanna live every day for you, Jesus, and accomplish the purpose you have for me. Thank you for what you've done. Amen and amen. Come on, assembly, let's put our hands together and celebrate everybody who's prayed that prayer, received the forgiveness of God. Come on, that's awesome. And now I want us all to do this. I want us all to just lift hands, open to heaven right now. God, I pray over every single person in here today that as we have been forgiven, we will go out and forgive. There are some here that are struggling. There's some here in consternation over a very, very painful situation. Some situations that have happened years ago, decades ago. Forgiveness is hard. God, give us the strength by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit of God that you've deposited in us. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same spirit that's in this room. God, that you would move in us, empower us, allow us to do what's not possible in our own willpower. And that's to release them into your hands, to forgive them for what they've done to us. We want to do what you did. We want to say what you said. Forgive Forgive them, Lord. The pain is great. They might not even understand how great it is, but I forgive them because you've forgiven me. Holy Spirit, move. We pray there would be testimonies. We pray there will be healing. We pray there will be freedom in the name of Jesus that'll come from this. Come on, and if you believe it today, say a big loud amen. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give God praise for his word and the work that he's doing in people's lives.